Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this uh, webcast on the EY Insurance Outlook for 2022. Uh, first, apologize for starting slightly late, but uh, we have some speakers who have difficulties to to join. So hopefully, we will be all uh, together for for this webcast. Um, First, I would like also to say in this International Women Day um, that I sincerely express my solidarity to all women who are impacted by conflicts uh, around the, the world. I'm Isabel Santenac. I am the EY Global Insurance Leader, and I'm very happy uh, to be joined today by uh, several speakers uh, coming from the industry, but also from EY. We uh, release every year our uh, global insurance outlook, and this year uh, we took uh, the opportunity to ask also several insurers to express their views together with our EY experts on the key trends they see for the upcoming uh, 18 months for the industry. And uh, we decided to focus specifically on three key trends. The first one is uh, around uh, open uh, insurance and ecosystems. The second one is around workforce transformation, which obviously is a critical topic after COVID-19 uh, remote working um, uh, environment. And the third one is on sustainability, which uh, has been uh, a, a, rising, a raising concern uh, over the last uh, few years and even more uh, after COP26 and the increasing pressure that we see on the insurance industry. Next slide, please. I'm going to introduce the speakers. Yeah, sorry. And, and you will have uh, the ability to ask questions in the chat, and you will see we will also have some polling questions uh, throughout uh, this webcast. So today's speakers are for the, the first topic around the uh, open uh, insurance and ecosystem. Uh, Bernard Klein Wessink from uh, EY is the global insurance customer and growth leader, uh, together with Federico Spagnoli, who is Prudential International Head of Product and Ecosystem. Uh, we will have then for sustainability Lorenzo Fatibene, who is our global and sustainable insurance leader. Uh, together with Linda Freiner, who is Zurich Insurance Group Head of Sustainability. And finally, we will have uh, Louise Lablaine, who is EY Emilia People Advisory Insurance Leader, together with Sue Davis, who is Markle Corporation Chief Human Resources, Resources Officer, speaking about workforce transformation. I'm going to move to the first topic, and um, I think we are going to switch. Uh, uh, if we have Federico on, maybe let's go to the first topic. And so I'm going, I'm leaving the floor to Bernard and Federico. Terrific, thank you. And let me just check Federico that we have you on via voice. Yes, I'm here, can you hear me? Absolutely, yes. thank you very much. And, and to our esteemed audience, Federico is the Emerging Markets Ecosystem Leader for Prudential and also the regional president for Latin America. So we're very happy to have him here. Um, Jade, if you could go to the next page. The topic of today uh, brings together two concepts that frankly get confused a lot. So I'll, I'll tee this up a little bit. Um, on the one hand, you hear a lot of talk on the right about open insurance. In, in some parts of the world, that's regulation driven. It's often very technology oriented uh, and, and it creates competitive situations that sort of connects everybody to everybody at low cost. And you wonder, is that really an attractive way to think about a technology enabled insurance future? There's a, a connected view or perhaps an alternative view that says, Maybe it's more about ecosystems. These are customer driven, i.e. put together things customers want from different places. It allows those people who put those capabilities together to grow, they're complementary and perhaps even collaborative. So that's the topic of the day. And, and perhaps uh, Federico, if I may start with you, 
Um, I understand that when you started the strategic decisions, uh, decisions at uh, Prudential, you even wrote a white paper on what we were really talking about. Is that right? That is right, Bernard. Uh, we've been, you know, thinking about how we can secure the leadership position of Prudential in the future. You know, we, we went through an exercise where we were looking into the next 10, 20 years. And we realized that in order for us to solve some of you know, the, the, the needs of the customers, especially as we think about the aging of the population, given our focus in life, retirement and asset management, we realized that Prudential alone would not be able to do it. Um, the idea of the ecosystem came up. Uh, I was working in a paper at the time, and we realized that following a framework where you, you know, seek collaboration, where you can leverage technology and data assets, which were not our area of expertise, was the main, you know, inspiration for us to pursue this model. And I can provide more color uh, in the in the next few minutes. Perfect, thank you. And Jade, if we could go to the first audience poll, that'd be terrific. It seems like a big question is, do you believe that ecosystems or open insurance should be focused on collaboration or on competition? So we would ask you to vote and share with us you know, how you feel about that. We'll give it a few seconds for everybody to click. I believe at the end of the conversation, Isabel will have the results and share them with you. So um, here's a very complicated picture, but it tries to draw your eyes from the left more towards the right, where we're saying we're not connecting everybody to everything, to everybody for everything. There are specific strategies. You know, if you look at the top, you'll see some digital carriers connect to non-insurance providers or you'll see carriers embed their insurance in you know, non-insurance providers or marketplaces. And you see others simply access brokers or you see brokers access distribution. And finally, you see in the bottom co-opetition, um, a way where multiple carriers perhaps do something together in distribution by making ecosystems connect to each other. Now, Federico, I believe that uh, your company has recently announced a bold move in this latter space, the competition space, with Medif Health. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, the, our first attempt to, you know, orchestrating an ecosystem with this idea of open insurance uh, was done in, in South America. We started back in 2020 in Argentina as a pilot, and then we followed in Brazil. And, and this picture is a good map of what we are trying to build in, in Latin America and eventually in other markets. So just to provide an example, we, we launched a, a wellness ecosystem that aims to help customers live in a, a healthier uh, and longer lifestyle and we partner with Vitality, which in a way is, is, is a competitor of us in certain geographies, as you know, uh, Discovery Group competes in, in some of the geographies that we, com we compete. And we launched this, this platform, which again is, is an app that helps customers uh, get access to nutrition, to, to rewards based on their healthy choices. And then what we did differently from what Vitality has done in, in other markets is that we decided to open this platform uh, to some of our, I would say, competitors in, in some of these local geographies. So in, in Argentina and now in Brazil, we are partnering with health insurers. Uh, Prudential doesn't do health insurance, but we realized that this platform, this app, could be beneficial to all consumers beyond prudential operations. Then you may wonder why, why are we doing this on, on top of the benefit for the customer? What is the benefit for prudential in this case? The opportunity here is to get access to, to data that today we don't have access to. So think about medical records, 
So by obviously with customer consent, by offering access to this platform to some of the local health insurers, they are allowing us to uh, uh, get access to, to data that is helping us for our underwriting and pricing decisions, among other things. And then it's creating opportunities for cross-selling and up-selling, opportunities for monetization. So, you know, this picture is exactly what we are doing uh, in, in Latin America. It's taking some time for us to build, but so far we're getting a lot of positive reaction from the market. Excellent. So it, it sounds like there was a terrific business opportunity and a specific business opportunity both for you and Medife. Um, now, it sounds like you were the instigator of this. You played a different role in this coming together. You were more perhaps an organizer than, a, than just a participant. Can you say a little bit more about why you decided to do that? Yeah, so that, that was also covered in my paper. I, I was trying to argue whether, uh, a, a, you know, an incumbent uh, like Prudential could be accepted as, uh, as an orchestrator in the ecosystem player. And, and the idea behind this is if you have the right reputation, you know, the right brand, the, the right credibility, if, if you are helping adding resources, so in our case, we brought the, the Vitality solution, and, and the different participants are accepting this. Uh, and then we, we set up what I refer as Chinese walls. So it's not a, a prudential insurance company running this ecosystem. Rather, it's a separate legal entity. It's a service company called Wellness Services with two operations in, in Argentina and Brazil. And it's completely separate. We have a you know a separate CEO and, and a different team with uh, also different type of skills and, and a different risk and control framework. And, and it's very interesting because when we are talking to to some of the participants to to join, like for example some of the, the largest banks, they're saying, listen, I don't want to have anything to do with prudential the insurance company because I also own an insurance company, but I would love to join the ecosystem, get access to the to the platform and the services that you provide and also collaborating in, in sharing data. So then the question is if the if some of these participants are not interested to, you know, do insurance with us, why would be the interest? And the interest here is because not only we are also the, you know, increasing the scale of the, the ecosystem, but also we are charging a service fee. So it's helping us to grow our fee income, which, as you know, is, is um, well regarded by the investor community as typically is a low capital, uh, low volatility, uh, and, and, you know, it's, 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 the, the margins are really good. So, so that is how we are operating today in this market. Terrific. And you mentioned, Federico, that this separate Greenfield almost entity had to develop new skills and capabilities. Can you say a little bit about what were new things you had to learn as a company that perhaps you hadn't be done in the past? Yeah, it, it has been a journey, right? Because again, we, we are a traditional insurer, so uh, we obviously had to come up with a completely different culture and a different type of skill set, as I mentioned before. Uh, we, we are treating this company, which is a service company, more as a tech company, as a product design company, again, and, and we're trying to, to separate the traditional, you know, legal and compliant approach that you typically apply to a regulated insurance entity. So here, you know, the culture is all, all about agile methodology. We have, you know, the typical scrum teams who are developing and fostering this concept of the tribes where roles and responsibilities are, are are more flexible in a way, uh, and people tend to be supporting project by project without fixed responsibilities. 
uh, we're also applying the concept of a virtual COE. Uh, so we have distributed the skills between uh, our home office in New Jersey, Brazil, Argentina, and we're even getting support from Southeast Asia on, on the digital user experience. So it's a completely different ballgame. I, I will summarize this as it looks more like a tech data company than our traditional insurance operation. That is very inspirational. Um, so I know it's it's early days in some ways, but uh, have you uh, been able to see results in the market already, or is that too early? No, you know, what's, that, that, that was the same question from my boss, right? When can we see the results, right? Uh, and, and I'm pleased to say that we we were very quick to see some of the, you know, early leading indicators. Uh, for example, we saw that customers engaging with the platform uh, show double the net promoter score versus those who are not using the, the, the platform. We also noticed as expected, as a lagging indicator, a better persistency rate. Uh, we're also seeing that the uh, number of new sales, uh, and more importantly, new partnerships for distribution of our existing products are, are improving. Uh, so I, I just uh, gave you the example of Medifest. Uh, I'm also very pleased to mention that we recently signed a term sheet with Mercado Libre, which is one of the largest, if not the largest, e-commerce and fintech platform in Latin America. And they also want to be part of the ecosystem. So, you know, a lot of positive momentum, to be honest. And I know we are not alone in this space. We are seeing a number of new entrants, but we are excited to you know, to be the, the first mover in, in this space. Well, thank you. And I, I think uh, many people on the phone, myself included, are, are looking to what you're doing as in, inspiring. Um, are, are there other examples of things you've seen happen perhaps around the world that you think are, are in the right direction that you are following? Yes, I mean, well, first, vitality in a way, uh, it has been, in my mind, the, the first one. As, as you know, they have a number of partnerships, and they've been very open to follow our, if you will, influence to open up the ecosystem. So now, typically, Vitality has been done uh, exclusive partnerships, market by market. Now they are open to multi-partnerships by, by market. Uh, they're also trying to get into more uh, health tech, uh, you probably seen the announcement uh, with AIA. They recently launched uh, a health tech joint venture in, in Asia, and, and they are planning to, to follow this path. And we also noticed that Finang, which was one of the first movers in, in the ecosystem space, but not in the sense of open insurance, uh, were much more close <coughs> Uh, you know, with, with their own subsidiaries, now they are opening up, and even they were offering us in, in Asia to to rent, if you will, some of their assets when it comes to, to platforms, apps, technology, and, and data services. So I think it's a trend that we're going to see more and more as, as some of these players who have been in a way, developing their own ecosystems, they feel more comfortable to open their ecosystem to other strategic partners. Terrific. Well, Federico, thank you for joining us. Um, apologies for the last minute technical issues, but we got your voice and we got your idea, so thank you for that. Let me just close by echoing uh, where Isabel started on this International Day of Women. Um, you know, I'm a Dutch kid from a small country who ended up moving to the States. And I got that idea from an American female who worked in the Netherlands, who, who inspired me to look at business education outside of the country. So women men mentors and sponsors and, you know, very important in my career and I hope in all of our careers. Thank you. Jay. I echo your comments, Bernard. Thank you very much.
So now we move to the next topic. Thank you, Bernard and Federico. Um, and we move to the next topic, sustainability, with uh, Lorenzo and Linda. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Hope you can hear me fine. And uh, so let's start with this important topic. Climate change and sustainability have risen to the top of board and c suites agenda. So if we can start, uh, Jade, if we can move to the next slide and start with the, some pulling question. Yeah. So uh, if you can please let us uh, know where is your company most focused in ESG strategy whether it's in reducing carbon footprint or adapting current, current products to be more green or developing, uh, uh, no, sorry, yeah, developing new customer solutions, embedding new governance and data collection processes or uh, um, to material low carbon investments. So if we take a few seconds to, to answer and then Isabel will kindly reply to you at the end of the um, webcast. So if we move, Jade, if we can move to the uh, next one. Yeah, uh, it's, um, we will spend a couple of minutes to give, uh, you know, our uh, EY outlook on this uh, topic, and then we will move to a Q&A sessions win with Linda. Uh, so, uh, leading insurers have, um, are now taking tangible steps to address the full range of issues and opportunities around the ESG, and they have multiple reasons to act. So, beyond the new regulatory requirements, which is a lot actually, uh, there is an increasing pressure from consumers and employees. But insurers also consider the negative impacts on the bottom lines and stock price. So together with the uh, investor expectations and potential restrictions of future assets to capital. Let me stress that sustainability strategy can be as much about purpose as profits and about growing both the top and the bottom lines. So we see companies adopting different strategies. Some insurers have keyed their sustainability strategies on providing protections against the physical risk of climate change. Proactive insurers are seeking more creative and innovative solutions to bridge the huge protections gap, such as parametric policies and those featuring carbon offsets. And to support the, the support for renewable and alternative energy has also matured quickly. PNC insurers will focus on this area, and we will likely see greater industry collaborations and the development of improved risk management framework. Other carriers are focused on uh, greening the global economy, which represents a huge growth opportunity for insurers. With a huge significant capital reserve and unsurpassed ability to assess and model risk, insurers, in fact, are central to designing a more sustainable economy and investing in the infrastructure to create it. By looking beyond existing climate risks, some insurers are also acting to mitigate and underwrite certain immature risks in ways that will allow traditional capital providers to invest. In fact, insurance is the great enable. It enables debts and equities to be deployed. It is the glue in our capital stock. And working with uh, Sorry, uh, and, and the upside opportunity are particularly compelling for insurers that can demonstrate visionary thinking and strong leadership. So the bottom line is that uh, sustainability is no longer just a feel good in initiative or branding exercise, but rather market requirements and business imperative. So what action should the insurers take? If you can move to the next slide, Jade. Insurance can take many meaningful steps in the near term to advance their sustainability strategies. Climate change is both a strategic and regulatory risk, but it cannot be managed solely by risk management or regulatory affair teams. Given its bad and potential impact across the business, the suitability agenda must be owned and executed by leaders throughout the organization, starting with clear guidance from the C-suite and the board. In the journey, therefore, insurers shall 
connect sustainability to the overall purpose and business strategy and define a roadmap with priority focus area, short term and medium term uh, milestones. Operations is key and they should embed sustainability strategy within operations across the business. Particularly, they should define the metrics and continuously embrace transparency and benchmark, all of which are key steps in tracking and reporting progress towards goals, especially in the capital markets. As reporting and disclosures become standardized, in fact, the most transparent companies will benefit from easier access to capital, increased customer loyalty, and better share price performance. For that, a key step is to improve ESG rating and security index inclusions. Senior leaders and board must understand the criteria behind the rating being developed by different agencies, as well as the requirements for inclusions in the ESG funds. The criteria may be complex and sometimes even inconsistent, but given their critical impact on assets, the capital and stock prices, insurers must do whatever it takes to improve ratings and secure inclusions. Next, they should engage to be part of the solutions, achieve greater collaborations across industry and between business and regulators. Examples are the Next Zero Insurance Alliance or the public-private partnerships being developed across the globe. Last but not least, they should pursue impact underwriting. They should embrace product innovation to address the protection gap through the development of more affordable and accessible products and build a relationship with the rising generation of consumers. They should explore different distribution mechanism and underwriting approach. So let's see now some of these actions as executed by a leading insurer, the Zurich Group. And to explore more about Zurich, I'm here with Linda Frehner, uh, who is the Group Head of Sustainability at Zurich Insurance. With her, we will address the major threats for an insurer transitioning to a greener economy, as well as the challenges for a Head of Sustainability. In fact, it is probably fair to say that the Head of Sustainability has to manage many attritions, but Linda is taking, is taking it very seriously and uh, she's committed for Zurich to make the difference. As a result, Zurich has set a, goal, uh, set a goal to be one of the most responsible business in the world. It has made climate change one of the three corporate strategic priorities. And the company has also updated its underwriting guidelines and added exclusions for certain type of high carbon businesses. But it's gone beyond that and has also launched new offering to help all type of customers adjust to climate related risk and transition to net zero. And now also plans to grow its renewable energy business. I hope uh, Linda, this was a, a fair summary of uh, some key initiatives. And uh, if you're okay, I will start with the um, first questions, which is in the journey to becoming an ESG responsible company, the very first step is, uh, or roadblock sometimes, is to attain strong executive sponsorship. Can you please tell us how you did achieve that? How you did balance the sustainable goals with the short-term economic results that many stakeholders demand? Thank you, Lorenzo and, and the NY team for having me. Um, I think when you look at sustainability and, and ESG, and, and it's really about the journey. And to if you start with attaining executive sponsorship, I mean, that's something that takes time. You have to interact proactively with the board, the executive management, really explaining thoroughly why and how the landscape is changing. What are the, the stakeholders expecting from us? How are we best positioned to help managing some of these at prominent ESG issues that society is facing. And really also recognize that it will not be a linear road. Um, I often describe it as a two steps forward, one step back process. So becoming a, a more sustainable and responsible company takes time. I mean, for Zurich, this journey has now been going on for almost 10 years because it's really about changing culture, changing, focusing, um, strengthening the purpose and really letting um, the, the long-term view of the business influence the way that we do business, the way that we innovate new products and services offer. So, so patience will really be of, of essence in this process. 
And back to your, your comment around how do we ban than setting sustainable goals while maintaining achieving short term economic results. I actually don't think that there is a trade off between sustainability goals and, and I maybe thought that we were actually we've moved beyond that because so that was a big topic in, in the beginning of, um, of of many sustainability journeys, uh, because ultimately we're taking a risk view on things. The better we manage ESG risk, whether or other types of risks, um, the lower the financial impact. So we shouldn't make a, a difference between other risks that we're managing as insurance company. Um, and if we look at it from pure cost perspective, many of the operational sustainability goals that uh, we have achieved have actually helped us to cut costs related to, um, to, to, to doing business, such as heating, travel, claims handling, to name a few. Um, and I, I think if we look at it from an insurance point of view, I mean, some of the, the policies that we have put out on, on particularly carbon intensive industries um, have actually positively helped companies uh, to um, also put pressure on their boards and their executive managers to diversify their, their, their portfolio. And as of lately, we can also see that the market for ESG-related products and services are growing significantly. And, and many of the global insurance companies now have ESG product uh, product teams. Um, so, so I think that there's so much going on in this space. I mean, and, and, and to finish up on the investment side, where we probably come the furthest um, we already see the studies confirming that companies with a higher ESG performance deliver better investment return. So there's nothing now that holds us back uh, from accelerating our sustainability journey. Okay, thanks. It's, uh, 10 years is a long, widening road, and we all appreciated your uh, uh, your effort in that. So, uh, so you achieved the the, uh, the, the sponsorship. Uh, you know, no one's going to go anywhere without that. But um, now, uh, if, if I can move to and ask, uh, what performance metrics you now use to prove the effectiveness of your ESG strategy? As you mentioned, um, we have three strategic priorities when it comes to uh, sustainability. One is about the transition to 1.5 future. One is around ensuring work sustainability. And one is to, to really inspire confidence in a digital uh, society. And of course, for each and every one of these uh, these priorities, we have KPIs. So if you look at it from a, from a climate perspective, it's of course around carbon emission reductions, uh, but it's also about um, looking at revenue from sustainable products. Um, if we look at if work sustainability, it's about how can we uh, ensure a more um, dynamic internal um, job market uh, by really focusing on, on, on enabling internal hirings. Um, it also looking at how do we train and how do we upskill our people. And if you look at it from a, from a confidence in digital society, we were one of the first insurance company to come out with a, a public a data commitment that we made to our customers as part of our, our sustainability ambition. And that of course is now looking at, okay, so how are we implementing this? What's the success rates that we see and how can we continue moving the needle on other topics uh, such as um, uh, responsible and ethical AI? Yeah, great. Um, if, if we can now move more on a say, forward looking as this is kind of the, the outlook. Most of the attention so far has been really on investor interest and regulatory requirements, uh, both on risk management and reporting, and particularly on climate change. What, what do you see the priorities over the next two to three years down the road? And going forward, where do you see the companies competing to create value? Um, I think that where we're now really, uh, the role as an insurance company is about helping other industries um, uh, transform and, and support um, also uh, private customers in them wanting to live a more sustainable life. Uh, so one thing is, of course, in the products and services that we offer. I mentioned in that to you that uh, many companies are looking at this. In 2020, we launched a service offering uh, climate resilience services uh, through a building on our risk engineering approach, and, and that has taken off tremendously because more and more companies are looking to how do I how do I manage climate risk and how do I build more resilience against it. Um, we've also uh, last year we launched um, a line of new ESG index funds uh, linked to our unit linked offering and the consumer response has been very strong. In, in Germany, for example, we see that 94 of, of, of new customers actually choose an ESG portfolio when they choose their asset management solution with us. Um, so, so we really see a movement now on, on the customer side. 
Um, but I, I think we're still uh, some way to go to make sustainability and ESG the key decision a factor um, when a company or a private person is, is selecting in their insurance company. Uh, so there we have to continue um, working on our uh, working on a focus. And I think ultimately, you know, our job here is also to make the world insurable. We talk a lot about what a four degree world would look like. And that would be very hard to insure. But yes, but our job is to make it insurable. So we also have to become much, much better in, in, in managing our own climate risk and how we advise our customers to do so. Absolutely. And uh, let's now move from, uh, say, from, from the customers to the, to the workforce. So um, do, you, do you think that um, we require new talents and skill sets? Do we need the ability to repackage uh, um, the technical capabilities uh, with the strategic imaginations uh, to think broader on the role of the insurer that the insurer can take? Or we do have, you know, all these capabilities already. I'm talking generally about, you know, the insurance industry. I think every industry right now is looking at how can we upscale um, how can we reskill people to really tackle this? So I don't think we are in a unique pos position compared to the professional services industry. So we all have to really invest in in upskilling and reskilling around around the environmental, social, and governance topics. Absolutely. And final questions. Um, th there's been a lot of talk about you know climate change, but uh, it is unfortunately also a period of massive social change in the world. Um, and I'm sure we believe uh, that the insurance industry can play a major role also in the transition to reduce the protection gap, but it, it is not an easy, an easy task. Um, think of the pension gap or the healthcare gap, just to name a couple. How do you believe companies can develop products and services fit for this purpose? How they can find new ways to deploy you know, their uh, analytical science-based knowledge and social behavior tools to effectively reduce the protection gap. And, and if you have any, any example at Zurich. I think the, the, the protection gap is and has always been one of the major challenges for us as an industry. And while we want to make insurance available for everyone, we do need to also take a risk-based approach. So it's really about finding that, that balance. Um, I think one is that uh, public-private partnerships remains a very important uh, road to reaching customers who would not otherwise turn to uh, to, to insurance companies. Innovation in digital channels are also an important lever to make sure that we actually can provide uh, services more cheaply. I think we also see a very fast growth in parametric insurance solutions um, that can also, also have, have help protect many more people um, than usual for, for lower price. Um, we, of course, also see the movement, and I think that was mentioned uh, by my colleague Prudential, uh, around offering more preventative health services. At Zurich, we have uh, launched a platform called LiveWell to really help um, improve health holistically, whether it's physical, mental, social, and financial health. Um, so really kind of bringing resources together to help individuals achieve their health and well-being goal. And all of this is, is driven by data. Uh, so, so there's a, an enormous amount of, of, of things that we now can do um, uh, at, a, at a lower cost and also easier and uh, make it easier available for our customers. Okay. Uh, th thanks for, you know, in the interest of time, thanks for having been here, sharing your experience at Zurich with us. And particularly, I've appreciated, the, you know, some characteristics that makes uh, uh, Zurich ESG strategy unique in the market when compared to peers. And I hope the audience found some of your thoughts inspiring as much as I did. And with that, I uh, will now move to the next topic, uh, workforce transformation with my colleagues, Louisa Blaine and her guest, Sue Davis. Thanks, Linda. Hi, everyone, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Sue Davies, who is the Chief HR Officer for Markel Corporation. And in her role reporting to the CEO and as a member of the exec team, she adopts a real commercial approach to her global people strategy and has some really interesting things to share with us about the workforce transformation that uh, Markel have been on. But first, before we go there, what I'd like to do is invite you for your final polling question. 
So if I can ask uh, the, the uh, question to come up on screen. And we want to understand from you which of the following strategies is a real priority for your company to access the skills and talent needed for the next two or three years. Options could include the internal development programs, external hiring, what we call acquihires, where you're looking at acquisitions for talent deliberately, partnerships, joint ventures and collaborations, or finally, digital innovation and increased automation as a potential source to really capture the key talent you need for the future. And as with other polls, we will uh, provide the opportunity to look at the results uh, with Isabel at the end of there. But let's move now on to the workforce transformation a little bit further before I go, come on to Sue. And even before COVID, the COVID pandemic, insurers were already looking at their skills gaps and thinking about talent practices and trying to work out how they instill a more dynamic or agile way of working. And then since the pandemic, obviously all of us, I'm sure, have experienced the intensified competition for key talent and employees suddenly wanting a lot more flexibility in how they work. And in fact, insurers, insurance workers are looking at 90% uh, reporting flexibility is really important to the types of roles that they want to be in going forward. When we then look at hybrid solutions and trying to create a culture and really think about the employee experience, workforce transformation in line with the huge technology transformation that's going on within many of our organizations really creates a very difficult challenge where automation and integration to really optimize operations sits alongside that employee experience. And we're starting to see a growing number of insurers really think about what does new strategies start to look like? What are the tactics we need to be making sure that really are aligned so that both from a human talent perspective and a technology perspective, we're really able to maximize what is needed for the organizations of the future. And we've identified five key aspects here that really are fundamental. First of all, assessing your current and future talent demands, whether that's something like ESG that we've just heard about, or maybe it's more on the underwriting front that uh, we will hear further from uh, and Markel's experience shortly, but really understanding those must have skills for the future. Understanding what that supply side looks like and to what extent perhaps we are, can look to those external sources or other places that we just touched on in the polling, or whether you need to build or buy or borrow from other sources to really make sure that that supply for your organization is coming through and that you're really attracting the best of the best. That focus on purpose, ESG and other talent strategies are becoming increasingly important to employees. And then alongside that, the work they're going to be doing day to day. And where are their opportunities to really differentiate for that customer experience, the human tech combinations, right from some of the front office experiences on FNL, for example, right through to some of the back office uh, and enabler functions are also important. And then lastly, how are folk really measured and recognised their performance? And what we are starting to see is a real shift here also, where not just maybe the unit measures of the past are being used, but behavioural aspects that really are encouraging collaboration, networking, and that excellence of customer experience coming to the forefront. So there's some of the big themes and trends we're starting to see. But... Uh, you know, let's now move to uh, Sue, if I may, and hear a little bit more about what's the reality for insurers and how is that experience really happening inside an organisation? So, Sue, perhaps thinking firstly about how COVID-19 has impacted your organisation and the workforce strategy, what is it Markel has been doing to really start to transform given some of the challenges associated with covid well, Louisa, thanks to, to you and the uh, EY team for having me uh, today and, and happy to share a few of the uh, insights and things that we've been up to. Um, I guess like many organisations, you know, March 2020 saw a huge um, shift for us. We only had about 10% of our uh, population pre-pandemic working fully remote and like everyone ended up with uh, everyone working from home for a period of time. Uh, you know, we then probably... Um, fall of 2020 moved to um, start thinking you know, strategically about what we wanted to do uh, in terms of our future ways of working. And that was a multi-pronged uh, project that we undertook. Working patterns was a key part of it. But along with that, we were definitely looking at skills. We were looking at technology. And we really set out three main principles uh, that we wanted to um, 
ensure that our new ways of working we're going to address firstly culture and leadership we have what we call the markel style which is very much our values and beliefs kind of north star we wanted to make sure that we were um, going to be thoughtful and intentional and that whatever we did was aligned with that we put customer very much at the center and making sure that what we did was um, obviously going to support and ensure uh, that we were aligning with uh, customers expectations and needs and then people and potential was the uh, the third of our principles, which was making sure that whatever we did was really going to make sure our people would reach their potential. Um, and also the spirit of teamwork, that's really critical uh, at Markel. So, you know, we knew that could get very complicated very quickly, um, but we, we really are a relationship-based organization and also a data-driven organization. So we did a lot of uh, pulse surveying of our individuals and then actually working with EY did some work to um, really garner and collect information from our managers about how their teams were working and operating and what was going to be needed there. And then we, um, in spring of 21, uh, decided that we were going to go to a... Um, three and two, three days in the office, uh, two days remote was going to be our kind of preferred hybrid option. Uh, we actually piloted that over the summer of 21, and we did that on a every other week basis. So we kind of used that as a way to get folks back into the uh, into the offices because we had about 60% of folks who hadn't set foot in an office. So uh, we did that uh, through September of 21 and then moved into that hybrid model very much though with a sort of test and iterate. We've set it up as a pilot for the first 12 months. We had to pause it with Omicron um, for six weeks, but we're now back um, and it seems to be working well. Um, I think, you know, we've just done, our, um, we've had great business results over the last uh, two years and then just done our engagement survey. And glad to see that um, engagement and enablement are actually up on where we were in 2019. And at the moment, we're holding our attrition uh, for 21 was very similar to 2019 as well. So uh, I'm certainly not complacent. There is a lot that's going on, a lot that we're needing to do, but that's a, a quick summary. Excellent. Thank you. And a hugely busy time over the last couple of years. But when you think now about your talent strategy going forward and, and sort of some of the biggest issues that maybe are driving that, what are you seeing at the moment that's sort of really focusing your attention? Um, I mean, I think I'd say firstly, growth. Uh, I mean, we have an aggressive growth strategy and um, it's really important for us to, and, and you know, we've talked as well about this year, the great war for talent. So for us, probably retaining as number one, retaining our great talent, and then obviously, you know, attracting the best talent uh, into our organization. So I would say that's a key driver is really fueling that growth uh, within the organization. Um, Secondly, I think, you know, from a talent perspective, we've had to really think about, you know, and I'm sure others have had the same issue. How do you onboard? How do you help with um, cultural and team working while we've been in this uh, virtual and now hybrid environment? So, you know, we brought a thousand uh, new employees into the company, about 20 percent over the last um, 12 months. And so really kind of working on that, that onboarding training piece. Um, and as I say, you know, certainly looking at new and different ways of attracting. So we've brought in um, new referral programs where we've had to. We've looked at sign on bonuses um, and then actively just working on our overall sort of candidate value proposition. Um, so those have all been uh, key aspects. And then I would say um, you know, diversity and inclusion, that definitely continues to be a, a key focus for it. It was pre-pandemic and it continues uh, very much to be front and center for us. Thanks. That's really interesting. And and I guess thinking about the talent pools, whether it's COVID or other mechanisms have suddenly really opened up the talent pool potential for your organisation as you think a bit more about that growth strategy. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit more on some of those key components as to how you're accessing and, and, and really making sure you're getting the best talent? Yeah, and I think for us, Louisa, as I say, probably our first um, recruitment strategy is really retention. You know, we are definitely very much focused um, on that and ensuring that we uh, work with our leaders to, to retain um, talent within the organization. Uh, you know, we spent some time last year going through stay interviews, really trying to understand what it meant um, for our employees. And then say our recent engagement survey will um, take a lot of time to analyze that, make sure that we're doing the right things that are important. Um, early careers, I think that is a key focus for us. Um, you know, we see that as a really important part of kind of priming the uh, the talent supply chain for us. And so, 
relationships with universities, colleges, uh, you know, what we are doing in terms of our own training programs, significantly increasing uh, the placements into those programs. I'm really um, spending a lot of time in that early careers, internships, apprenticeships, um, things that are really creating that, uh, that supply chain. Um, and then a little bit to really refresh and, and continue to update our talent acquisition approach. I think that's that's being uh, being key. Actually, on the US side, we're uh, moving to more of a um, hybrid. I think is the <laughs> the uh, the nature of, of all things. But um, trying to combine sort of RPO for parts of our um, talent acquisition activity along with um, our internal team. So those have all been tactics that we've been we've been working on. And if I think a little bit about some of the trends we're seeing, one of the important things that many organisations are really trying to assess is, well, what are the capabilities or top skills that you need in the future? Where do you think that Markel really need to either address the, the skills gap or, or maybe grow to really maximise the capability you have internally? Yeah, and I think, you know, we certainly have a focus. Uh, we've done a lot of work uh, recently on sort of underwriting and underwriting of the future. You know, what's that going to look like? Really thinking about, um, you know, career paths for our underwriters. Uh, we certainly have a major focus on retail and, and bringing in additional talent in the in the retail space. Um, a claims area that, uh, you know, as, as we're growing the company, that continues to, to grow. And I think, you know, others have mentioned about, you know, what is the right balance of, um, you know, both technology and then uh, claims and claims talent. And then just generally technology, digital data, uh, what we need to um, to look at there. But then I'd say sort of over uh, all of that, we always sort of front and center always is the cultural fit. I mean, our, our style, yeah. our approach. Um, you know, ability to work collaboratively. That always is a, a sort of an overriding factor for us that kind of technical skills is really important in each of those different areas, but that is, is always going to be critical. And then continuing to build our own and uh, you know, provide people with more rotational opportunities, chances to actually move around the organisation, something else that we're, we're really focused on. Excellent. I know we've talked in the past around sort of keeping people through succession planning, uh, leadership and manager planning as well um, as being key. But, um, but perhaps maybe for our, our last question, Sue, if I may, if you think about longer term um, and recognising that actually this isn't just an HR challenge, but really needs to be you know, critical for business leaders to, to embrace and, and sort of take some steps immediately to make sure that t talent liquidity and, and value of people is recognised. What sort of things are you looking and expecting of your business uh, to really play their role. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree, Louise. I think, you know, workforce transformation, you're right, it's, it's a long-term long journey um, and it's one where the partnership between, you know, HR working really closely with the, our business leadership is going to be critical. Um, I think it's really important that what we do is coordinated um, and integrated. I think it's very easy to do a lot of kind of separate things that don't kind of pull together. And so we're really trying to think through all of this with that sort of employee experience lens and be intentional and holistic in the way we, we think about that. And we've kind of, um, at the moment, our priorities, we've sort of, I guess, got this, this view of kind of reconnect and focus forward. So we're really trying, you know, on the, the reconnect piece, that's a lot about, you know, how do we re-engage, you know, and, and again, retention, we've talked about previously in terms of talent retention. Um, Re-onboarding, I think, you know, we've got some catch up to, to play with that in terms of those who new starters over the last two years. And then overall team development, I think, you know, just the, the power of teams being together. And as certainly we've been coming back in this hybrid, you know, that's something that our, our leaders are really, um, we're working with them to focus on on that. And then focus forward, I think we've already spoken about a sense of purpose, um, providing you know, clarity for folks on strategic direction and, and continuing to reinforce our culture. So um, I think, you know, we've got a, an upcoming in-person senior leadership team. We'll have our 150 top leaders around the world together, hopefully at the end of, of March. And that's really going to be the focus for us to, um, to continue working in partnership to transform the workforce and our ways of working. Brilliant. Thank you very much. We could talk even further, I'm sure. But Isabel, perhaps I can hand over to you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, both of you. Very interesting. Um, if we can see the poll's results before we, we close. So in the first question, you see there is quite shared views about the open and competitive uh, ecosystems or so not entirely open, but, but collaborative. So a very interesting uh, outcome. Uh, on the second one, which was on sustainability, 
uh, I think there was a, yeah, a reducing carbon footprint is your uh, main focus, which is uh, for the planet, I would say, but you see also developing new customer solutions uh, is also high on your agenda together with governance and data collection processes. And on the last one on workforce transformation, uh, interestingly, I think 30% are focusing on uh, development, internal development programs, so uh, upskilling your people. Hiring, of course, is high also. And uh, the last, uh, the third one is more digital innovation and increased automation. So uh, very interesting uh, response to the poll. I would like to thank a lot our guest speakers, Federico, Linda and, and Sue, it was very interesting. Thank you all for attending. Uh, apologize for the small uh, technical problems we had and, and the late start. You can find the Global Insurance Outlook on our website, ey.com. And I wish you a good uh, end of the day or a good day and uh, looking forward to a next uh, webcast uh, soon. Bye.